Good early evening, everyone. I'm amplified. You can all hear me. I can see you. I'm going to come up here and not hide behind the podium and also now make my iPad so that it doesn't try to go sideways on me while I'm using it. There we go. Good. Now, the beautiful thing about this, this evening actually represents a full circle for me in a lot of ways. So I've lived in Australia for just a little bit more than 14 years. It has always been a pleasure to come to the State Library and I have been doing things at the State Library of Victoria since I arrived in Australia. And I always come and visit the State Library whenever I'm in Melbourne for more than a few hours. And seven months ago, I sat at a table at the Moach, which is on the other side of this building, with Jonathan and I pitched him on the beginnings of an idea that I had. Now the coffee had been scheduled some time in advance. The pitch was basically impromptu and now here we are. So it is enormously satisfying to begin things today where things started. So I'm completing hopefully the first leg of what's going to be a longer journey. Now my pitch to Jonathan had been inspired by this. There was an article in The Australian that appeared on the 1st of May, which reported that Facebook had been shopping around a deck to various advertisers in Australia. And the reporter for the media section of The Australian had seen the deck. And the deck basically told the advertisers that Facebook had such sophisticated analysis tools that they could tell when kids as young as 14 years old were feeling stressed, defeated, overwhelmed, anxious, nervous, stupid, useless, a failure. And Facebook told advertisers they could know this in real time so that they could stick an ad in their feed that would get the kids to buy something that would help them feel better about themselves. Now, Facebook was exposed. They immediately issued a public apology. They said, oh my goodness, it is wrong to target young children in this way. But that pitch was not put together by some rogue Facebook employees. It was put together by the two managing directors of Facebook's Australian operations. And this wasn't the first time that Facebook had been exposed as a manipulator on a rather large scale. So back in 2014, there was a scientific paper that was published in the Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences. Researchers were demonstrating something they called emotional contagion. So that means when you're sad, you might make the people around you feel sad. When you're happy, you might make the people around you feel happy without actually actively communicating it. It's contagion. So there's no visible means, but you actually just sort of pick up on the emotional vibe of other people. And Facebook tested this by manipulating the news feeds of 689,000 people on Facebook. What they did was they would stick more negative articles into the news feeds of some people, and lo and behold, those people started to become sadder, and lo and behold, that emotional contagion spread through their networks of friends. On other people's news feeds, they put more happy articles in, and those people seemed to be happier, and that emotional contagion would spread through those networks, and everyone went, that's a very nice bit of research. As science, it was a roaring success. There was a problem. Facebook had not asked any of its users for permission to conduct that study. And again, as soon as that became clear, Facebook apologized, admitting it was wrong to emotionally manipulate their users that way. So here we are, December 2017. There's about 2 billion people all around the Earth who are using the Facebook news feed. The average Facebook news feed user looks at it for 50 minutes a day. Must be very interesting if people are spending so much time looking at their newsfeed. And how the newsfeed got so interesting, that's a story. Now, Facebook went public in May of 2012. So as a public company, what does it have to do? It has to increase revenue so that the shareholders continue to hold the stock, drive the stock price up so that the company is worth more. Facebook earns money by selling highly targeted advertising because it knows so much about you, it can sell an ad that's designed for you. And so Facebook needs to have a lot of revenue and they need to have a lot of ad inventory. So they need to be able to sell a lot of ads to a lot of users. There's two ways that Facebook can do that. 
One way is to just increase the number of people on Facebook, and that was easy because of something called a network effect. The more people that are on Facebook, the more likely it is other people are gonna get on Facebook so they can connect with the people who are already on Facebook. And so over the period of time from 2012 to about 2017, Facebook grew from a little bit under a billion users to, a little, to, to just around two billion users. So in that sense, Facebook's growth strategy worked very well, but that wasn't enough for Facebook. Facebook needed to do something else. They needed to do what they call, and they still call, increasing user engagement. And this is where things get very interesting because this is what led to the world we're in today. I wanna to explain to you what Facebook did to increase user engagement. So Facebook profiles its users. Now, in 2010, what did that mean? It kept a list of your likes and your dislikes and the movies and your music and the friends that you knew. It was all very easy back in the beginning, all very straightforward. From around 2013, as Facebook work to increase user engagement, that profiling became much more sophisticated. This was exactly the point when artificial intelligence on a massive scale became cheap enough for big companies to start to use. Computers had grown fast enough that they could start to learn. And machine learning systems, in order to learn, they're hungry for data. You have to feed them lots and lots and lots of data. And it turns out that Facebook had lots of data. Every time you open the Facebook app on your mobile, everything that you do, so that's not just the things you press on, but every swipe you make, every scroll, every click through, every like, every share, every article that you open, how long you read that article, whether you share that article, how long until you open the app again, all of that information goes into Facebook. It goes into your Facebook profile. So Facebook is constantly learning more about how you're learning to use Facebook. So think of it as a lot more than a profile. I want you to think of it as Facebook is running a tiny little simulation of you in its Facebook cloud somewhere, which is basically a model of all of the interactions you've ever had with Facebook. And that little model of you is used to make decisions about how Facebook curates your newsfeed. Now, curate is a really interesting word. That's the word Facebook uses. I prefer to use the word censor. Facebook chooses what goes into your newsfeed using your profile, so all of that data they're gathering about you to make decisions about what goes into the newsfeed. When Facebook adds something in, they watch you react to it. Do you like it? Do you dislike it? Do you share it? Do you engage with it? Do you disengage with it? All of that goes into this machine learning profile. And so your profile over a period of time learns how to give you exactly what you need to see in order to stay engaged with Facebook. And all of that meant that the news feed became very engaging. User engagement went up, and Facebook is now well on the way to becoming one of the shortlist of the first trillion dollar companies. Sometime in the next year or two, Facebook will pass a trillion dollar valuation, as will Amazon, as will Apple, as will Google. Here's the thing, there's this unexpected side effect that comes from giving people what they want. Now, I have some bad news. Every single one of us is at heart a narcissistic egoist. <laughs> there is no shame in admitting this, all right? As adults, most of us spend most of our time trying to grow beyond that because it's an infantile state of being. But underneath all of these lovely layers of socialization, deep down inside, what do we want? We want to be right. We crave being right. We need to be right. Being right is part of what satisfies that fundamental narcissistic need that we all have as human beings. And that explains a, psycho a psychology phenomenon known as cognitive bias. Cognitive bias, we tend to focus on the things that agree with the things that we already believe to be true, 
and we tend to ignore or discount the things that we don't believe. So Facebook has constructed a machine learning system that seeks to engage us by amplifying our cognitive bias. That's the secret of the Facebook newsfeed. That's why it's so engaging. It's giving us exactly what we want to see. And what we want to see are the things that confirm our belief about the world. Because when you confirm your belief about the world, you feel good. And so what happened? To increase user engagement, Facebook built a global cognitive bias amplifier. Facebook is literally a global scale artificial intelligence system keeping all of its users under continuous surveillance, showing all of those users exactly what they want to see. And that's created a big problem for us because a cognitive bias amplifier feeds you what you want to see without respect to the truth. So what's been happening is over the last couple of years, we have been accelerating away from the truth. We have been being propelled into our own little worlds. Each of these worlds are a custom expression of our own cognitive biases. And so back in February, BuzzFeed published an article which showed an analysis of two Facebook news feeds, mother and daughter. Mother is right wing, daughter is a lefty. They showed the daughter's feed to the mother and the mother's feed to the daughter, and neither could believe what the other was seeing. It was as if they were from completely separate worlds. And they were. And so if you're wondering why some of our politics feel so strident these days, why it is seeming so hard to find agreement and consensus and common ground upon which we can build consensus, remember this. There are two billion people out there learning about the world by engaging with a cognitive bias amplifier, one that is confirming their beliefs, entrenching those beliefs, and tending to make those beliefs more extreme. Now, that's bad, right? And it would be a great thing if maybe we could just stop using Facebook. But we've had four years now of seeing exactly what we want to see. And we feel very comfortable in a world that is conforming to our beliefs and to our prejudices. The real world is starting to seem positively ugly and unfriendly. It makes us feel wrong and bad. No one wants to feel wrong and bad. So we keep on using Facebook. And there's no really easy way to put this. We're addicted people because this isn't just something that we've become habituated to. This is something that is destroying our mental health. It's eroding our cognitive capacity. It is corroding the public sphere. And yet we can't seem to quit it. Welcome to the age of surveillance capitalism, where, oh, by the way, that's real. Artificial intelligence plus pervasive surveillance, it seems to be designed specifically to serve your needs, but what it's actually doing is it's depriving you of your free will. Now, I have some bad news for you. Facebook may have built this bomb, but now everyone knows how to build one. It doesn't really matter if Facebook goes away tomorrow. It doesn't matter if everyone in this room stopped using Facebook tomorrow. We all now know how to build global scale artificial intelligence systems that can manipulate the mood and the beliefs of entire populations. That is quite an achievement, sort of. I want to give you an example of how this might work in a completely different context. I want you to consider the humble, if very evil, pokey machine. Now, you may not know this. The software in a pokey machine has been specifically designed to provide irregular rewards in a way that evokes compulsive behavior in people. It is embedded in the software in a pokey machine. Let's take that idea up a level. 
Let's imagine that every camera in a casino fed into a sophisticated artificial intelligence system that could recognize facial expressions, even read the sweat off of someone's forehead, and then feed that back into the results of the poker machine. The entire environment of the casino would be watching and learning and responding in the way that best evokes a compulsive behavior. I mean, that's what Facebook has done. Why wouldn't Crown? This is what the world looks like across a century where machines are observing and learning from and manipulating our behavior. This is the world where influence has been weaponized. And this is going to emerge as a pervasive feature of the world where there are already cameras everywhere and microphones everywhere and connectivity everywhere and all of it feeding into machine learning systems that are continually refining their profiling of us. Now, before you collapse into paranoia, and I gave a version of this talk on Friday night where I handed out tinfoil to everyone in the audience so they could all have a helmet, all right? I want to point out that there are actually all sorts of flavors of weaponized influence. Some of them you might even like. At its most innocuous, it might be an alarm clock that knows exactly when to wake you up because it is integrating a continuous stream of surveillance of you. It's built a profile, and it's using that profile to make its decisions. And that seems almost nice, because you would basically never have a jarring wake up in the morning, because the system knows you so well. It knows exactly how to bring you around. And I'm calling that world surveillance utopianism, where all of the data being used is being gathered to help you. But there's clearly another side to things, right? Where all of this data is being continually gathered to coerce you. Now, for the last year, it's been reported that the Chinese government is developing what they're calling the social credit system. Every citizen is going to be issued a rating that will be drawn from and generated by their participation in civil society. So that's every microblogging post to Weibo, every link shared, every website that gets visited, every block that gets walked, every purchase made, every hour works. All of this will eventually factor into an individual social credit. Most of the infrastructure for that level of surveillance is already well in place in China because there's been a rise in smartphones and the collaboration of the Chinese big three, Baidu, which is the Chinese Google, Alibaba, which is the Chinese Amazon, and Tencent, which is the Chinese Facebook. The Chinese government is already deep in them. They are already gathering the data there. So they have all of the data gathering that they need to be able to build social credit ratings on their citizens in real time. It is not clear what it will mean to have a high rating. But it's already been made clear that individuals with low social credit ratings will find it hard to find jobs and housing and educational opportunities. And effectively, what will happen is the entire apparatus of the Chinese state will turn its back on these citizens until they mend their ways. And that surveillance authoritarianism, it doesn't really feel like what we think of, particularly in modern China, where someone gets kidnapped and then appears four months later in front of a show trial making a confession. But just because we can't see the whip hand here, that doesn't mean we can't see how the fear of that whip hand would shape our actions, or in this case, would shape the actions of the Chinese public. Now, whichever way the future goes, and as the future becomes the present, it tends to become a mix of both the best and the worst. All of the techniques that I've talked about, these are all overflowing into basically every system that's connected. Each of them are now watching, each of them are learning, each of them are responding in just the way they know they must to get you to do what they want. So everything in the world is starting to use the data collected about you to move you. And that's why this isn't really just a story about Facebook. This is a story about us. OK, so at this point, you're thinking, my god, Mark, this is horrible. Please stop. But we are not done. It 
gets weirder. You have all of this technology of surveillance capitalism around you, watching you, learning about you, trying to undermine you. That much is obvious. All of this is now about to combine with a brand new technology. It's a technology that is just emerging, a technology that's going to take it to a new level. So, it's Christmas morning a few years from now. Look what the kids have found under the tree. They look pretty much like a bulky pair of spectacles. But when you put them on, well, that's very different. They power up, and all of a sudden, you're thrust. Well, you're thrust into a new version of the world, because it's the world, but it's the world plus. Things are being added to that world. They look real. They act like they're real. You treat them as though they're real. Welcome to the world of augmented reality. Augmented reality is the next big thing. Everyone in tech agrees about this. This is the tech that gets you to stop from staring down at the screen at your smartphone all the time. It gets you up and looking and engaged with the world around you. A world that's better than it was, more interesting than it was, more finely tuned to your tastes and to your needs. Now this year, at its big developer conference. Now, Facebook's big developer conference, you know what it's called? Does anyone know? Fate. I'm not making that up. <laughs> Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg opened up his keynote, promising that within a few years you would have these augmented reality spectacles. Facebook is working really, really hard to make these spectacles a reality. That is the opening shot from his keynote this year. Now, here's an important thing that no one is telling you about augmented reality. And if you don't take anything else out of this talk, remember this. Augmented reality has to see the world around you in order to work. Because if it doesn't, things are going to pop up in the middle of other things. Like a robot will pop up in the middle of the table. It'll look like a bad transporter accident from Star Trek. And it will just freak you out. And it will scare the kids. So in order to work, augmented reality has to maintain a state of constant surveillance of the world around. Augmented reality is a technology of surveillance. Now, I'm going to give you an example. How many of you own an iPhone 10? Anyone in the room? No one in the room. I'd probably almost be worried for Apple. So you know that the iPhone 10 has this whizzy new face ID camera. You've all seen that, right? Because Apple's made it very clear. So it's called a true depth camera. And when Apple introduced it, what they also introduced was it's not just for unlocking the camera with your face. The camera can read your face in real time. And Apple introduced all of these lovely tools. And here's the tools being used. That's someone's face just being read with the face camera in real time with the, touch, uh, the true depth camera. Now, for Apple, what are they going to do? That means that you can map your face onto a poo emoji. We've all seen this now, right? For another app developer, let's say Facebook, it gives them real-time access to your facial expressions. Smile for the camera. And again, this is simply the technology of augmented reality working as designed, working as a surveillance technology. Now, Facebook is going to love augmented reality. Facebook loves watching your every move. Augmented reality for Facebook is like a hypodermic needle that's plugged directly into your experience. And it will feed all of that experience right back into Facebook. It will get fed into your profile. It will be built into your profile. That profile already determines what shows up in your news feed. And so now what's going to happen is Facebook is going to use that profile to determine what shows up in your reality. It's going to fashion you your own private world on the fly. Facebook is going to be curating your reality, delivering you the best of all possible worlds. And all you need to do for that is give Facebook access to your eyes. Of course, 
we really have already given Facebook access to our eyes because for 50 minutes a day, staring into the news feed, we are believing what it tells us because it tells us what we want to hear. It's inside our heads now. And once it's inside our heads, all sorts of things can happen. There's this shadowy firm. Have you all heard about Cambridge Analytica? This shadowy firm, Cambridge Analytica, founded by Robert Mercer, who's probably the closest to a Bond supervillain we have on planet Earth right now. Genius computer scientist slash billionaire hedge fund manager slash absolute right wing nut. <laughs> Funder of Breitbart, by the way. It has been gathering all of the profiling data that it can on voters. And it has been integrating the profile data. And remember, there's a lot of data out there in the world that's not Facebook's, because everything in the world is gathering this profile data, and most of it is for sale. And so it gathers this data, it builds profiles, and it uses that profiling data to send political messages to Brexit voters and to Trump voters targeted for exactly when they are most vulnerable to those messages. Does that technique really work? Well, we know we got unexpected results in Brexit. We know we got unexpected results in the American presidential election. They were statistically unlikely. Do we know that the difference was Cambridge Analytica? No, we absolutely do not. But we can see how it would work, because we saw Facebook promising exactly the same sort of treatment for teenagers who were having a moment. But this is for political ends. Weaponized influence, this is the new technology of power. And people are going to be battling over who controls this technology. So just as China asserted control of its big three internet companies, governments around the world are now going to be grasping for control of surveillance capitalism. And according to John Robb, and I quote him in the Mianjin article, What's going to happen is those companies are going to cut deals with governments around the world. Surveillance capitalism is going to become the sanctioned media monopoly in the 21st century in return for providing a whole new level of social management. In other words, they'll control what you see in return for a monopoly on what you see. And that tie-up turns surveillance capitalism into the agent of state power. Now, as I say, that has already happened in China. This is not some sort of hypothetical. That's happened in China. It's clearly happening in Russia. There's a huge danger that it could happen in the liberal democracies in the Western world because the temptations of social management via pervasive surveillance and profiling fed back into a fully connected environment, those temptations are very, very powerful. And the problem is, if we do have our feelings about this, if we do want to maybe fight against something like that becoming an eventuality, that's starting to become very hard because it's very hard to find a public social sphere to talk about this about that doesn't exist on Facebook 10 years ago, before everyone had a smartphone before everyone had jumped on Facebook. We had a public social sphere and a public digital social sphere that was connected and open and free. And that has gone away. If a group doesn't exist on Facebook, we don't join it. If an event isn't promoted on Facebook, we don't know about it. If your friend isn't on Facebook, you just gradually lose touch. We need to hit the rewind here. We need to think about the world that we want, the comments that we want, the social conversations that we want, the world that we want. We need to think about the world we want, and then we can have a think about the tools that we'll need to support that world. We have learned a lot in the last 10 years. Most importantly, we've actually started to learn what we've done wrong. Because this isn't really about technology. This is now about us. So we need to actually have a think about how we can come together and how we can share together and how we can learn together. And we have to get that right, because right now it is almost completely wrong. Cognitive bias amplification is making it so hard for us to live with the differences of others that what's happening is we're tending to seek deeper immersion in our own cognitive bias. We are turning up the volume to drown out the voices of others. 
And that means that we are bringing the last days of reality on ourselves. OK, so what can we do? We stop using Facebook? Sure, if you want to. I would say good luck trying to convince 100 million Indonesians who think that Facebook and the internet are the same thing that they need to stop using Facebook. Because that's not really the problem here. What's happening is much broader. Facebook is the symptom of this broader problem. And it has recently led me to ask a very difficult question. So the modern era begins mid-17th century with what we now call the Enlightenment. Right? The Enlightenment is where we get this idea, this modern idea, that knowledge is a good thing. It frees us from ignorance, from want, from superstition, from illegitimate power. And our modern secular world is the embodiment of that idea. The state Library of Victoria is the institutional embodiment of that idea. That knowledge made freely available to the public is an unalloyed good. And we became really focused on this aspect of what we are as a culture. And we spent the last quarter of a century building a civilization of shared knowledge. Now, Carl Jung very keenly observed that a superabundance of any force becomes its opposite. He, he used a word from Greek for this, anantheodromia. <laughs> thank you, there we go, anantheodromia. And it's any movement at its maximum starts to betray its opposite qualities. And there is no question that we live in a time of a superabundance of knowledge. And that has led to the emergence of two qualities that I, I'm starting to see as shadow forms of enlightenment. Now, the first quality is very simply that the web, particularly via Facebook, but well beyond that, the web has become an ignorance amplifier. You know, we see this in some of the more conspiratorial movements online. The flat earthers are a really good example of this. There is a real capacity for ignorance amplification that is located in our knowledge civilization. People rarely invest in that culture fully. It tends to self-limit. But there's a second quality. And that second quality emerges from the recognition that knowledge itself has a shadow nature. It can be used to support. It can also be used to undermine. And when information is scarce, it's difficult to do either of those. Before a generation ago, you needed to command immense resources in order to weaponize information. Nations could do it. Few others could. Where information is hyperabundant, it becomes far easier to undermine a person or an institution or a civilization with information. Knowledge can be weaponized. And a culture which prizes knowledge as one of its highest virtues, it produces a lot of potential for weapons. And once a knowledge-based civilization starts to weaponize knowledge, once it starts beating its plowshares into swords, that process spreads by the same process of knowledge amplification that created the knowledge-rich culture in the first place. If you do it here, Tomorrow, they're doing it everywhere. And this is what feels like a real danger to me. Because the last days of reality, they are a penny drop moment when the whole world wakes up to the weaponization of knowledge. And the Enlightenment reveals its full shadow. It's no longer just the agent of freedom. It's also a cruel and pitiless master. And this quality of knowledge, at least as expressed in human beings, doesn't admit to an easy solution. There's no fix to this. This is something we are all going to have to learn how to live with. We have been weaponizing the material world for at least five million years. We've gotten very, very good at that. And so good that it is an act of conscious choice that we weren't all vaporized decades ago. 
That's now happening to the world of information and knowledge. Everything that we know has the potential both to help us and to be used against us. And we know this now. We can see this knowledge unfolding in this world. We can feel it shaping this world. And we need to keep that knowledge at the forefront of our minds, because this may now be the most important thing we know. If we forget this, we lose everything else, because the machines close in around us, and everything becomes utterly artificial forever. Thank you. We're all real. Mark, uh, scary. I want to know before your questions, and that's, that's what's coming next. We had choices. You, you say we could have vaporised ourselves. Yeah. We make choices. We, we have the yeah. capacity to, to shift our world and to avert catastrophe. Yeah. At what point does, do we lose that capacity in yeah. this scenario? At what point does it become irretrievable? If we build systems that are so clever at manipulating us that we effectively become unaware of that manipulation, then we are literally rabbits in a cage. And part of, you know, you and I had the conversation back in May, but this conversation in a way started in January when I was at the Consumer Electronics Show and I was walking around with one of my very old friends. And both of us were expressing it was a very inchoate level of unease about what was going on. But it was clear that some of the decisions that had been made about the way technology would be deployed and how it would be used and the ends to, to which it would be used were starting to have visible effects that were not going in a good direction. And I think when we start to think, think about this, one of the reasons I wanted to write this was because in some ways I'm putting this in front of my peers, who are the people who create these technologies, that we have to think consequentially about the actions that we're doing. If there's an engineer at Uber who's writing code to do some machine learning to confuse a competitor, all right, and A, that's illegal, but B, is that ethical? And we haven't really, I think, built strong ethical frameworks around these systems that are now so pervasive and so smart. And since we're building this as the fabric of civilization and it's without an ethical base. But until those machine systems become machine generated, until we lose that capacity for human intervention, until we stop having people writing that code and the code is then written by the machines who've learned to write the code. And, and to some extent, all machine learning systems write their own code, to some extent. But these machines aren't self-directed. Human beings still set up all of the initial conditions for these systems. They still design all of these systems. There might be a tipping point in that. Though, there might be. <sighs> it's not, that tipping point does not, to the experts in the field, does not feel near around that. The machines might make recommendations about the right way to achieve a particular goal, but the goal is still going to be generated. That's what they're telling you. I, I, could, I, I could very well be a rat The, the in other cage. side of this is that if, if the outcome here is to create this world which satisfies us at a, at a deep level, which gives us everything we want, right. that, I mean, the, 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 the totalitarian state of the future is, is one which gratifies us rather than makes it's us brave, fearful. It's Brave New World, it's not 1984. So what's wrong with that? Well, it's interesting because one of the one of the critiques that I think is I'm rereading Brave New World right now. It's just it's lovely. You should go back and reread it. Is that it forces an infantilization on people, so it basically stops their own growth process. It stops their own. And you know, this is Huxley. Huxley was effectively mystical. He believed in the human potential and the human process for growth. And I think we want to make sure that we retain our own agency around what our own growth process is. And you can have an argument about free will, and this does raise all of those questions around that. But I guess what you want is you want as much transparency. If there are things out there that are manipulating you, are you aware of them? Are they hiding themselves? Why are they hiding themselves? Those are almost the questions. You know, if you have an alarm clock that you know is watching you to wake you up at the right time, that's a trade-off because it's transparent you may be willing to make. 
But if you're having something that's slowly inserting messages in your day so that you buy a certain thing at the end of that day and you're not really aware of it, it's like subliminal advertising used to be in films. That's where you need to now start to take a much more nuanced view. And so a lot of what this has to do with is, in, is the ethics of these, the design of these systems. Are they transparent? Are they accountable? Uh, do they help build community? These are qualities that we can actually now start to use as human qualities that become a beachhead into making uh, uh, queries and making interrogations of these systems. Because you assume a certain amount of, of um, if not malevolence, of... I don't think Facebook is evil. I think Facebook is as trapped in this as everyone else. Facebook built this monster and now they're trapped because they can't change how it works or user, user engagement decreases. And, and they lose money and everyone gets fired and who knows what. And it's interesting because people I know who know Mark Zuckerberg, right? They say Mark is totally he focused. awfully nice. He's, he's, he's completely focused on making Facebook better. Right? And you can see in his framework what that means. It's not so much increasing user engagement, but making it a better experience so people just want to use it more. And yet the way that that's actually been effectively expressed has had all of these other qualities associated with it. That's the, the possibility you raised too in the Mianjin piece is, is, is the transition of, of, of Zuckerberg's ambitions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and you know, he, was, he was definitely out in Iowa talking to, talking to Facebook users. And, it's the presidential state, right? It's the state that you campaign in first if you want to win a presidential primary. And some pundits have laughed it off. Some pundits have really raised their eyes. I don't know that we can necessarily make a call on that. All we know is that he has unprecedented levels of power. Is there something though vestigial in, 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 in collective humanity that, that fights against this? I mean, is our sort of innate network greater than all this, that the thing that we all share in the back of our brains, which is our own, which is not contaminated by this. With the levels of tribalism that are being exhibited in most of the communities that are most connected to Facebook, I'd have to say that there's a tribal brain that's also really old that's getting really activated. And those two brains are having a bit of an, those two sides of us are having a bit of an argument right now. Your turn. Oh, here we go. Um. There are, there are, sorry, there are, there are, microphones will descend, and here comes one now. <laughs> well, unless you're being recorded, you do not exist. We actually knew you were going to ask the first question. <laughs> Long-time listener, first-time caller. Um, we're the last generation that knows the world. Pre-digital. Pre-digital. Right. So we've then run into the fact that our children inherently do not like the, in my day, but, so how do we document... The, this transition so that we can actually make available the information that says that the transition's bad because the transition will hide it. Well, so, I mean, transition good or bad, I think part of what we can teach children is that machines lie because we've probably taught them simply by our own activities that machines don't lie. Mom's always looking at her smartphone when she needs to know something and so there's, there's a lack of critical distance around that and you know we've got to start that with ourselves. We have to be much more suspicious of our Facebook newsfeed when we see something pop up that, that confirms some our belief that we think about the world or about a particular politician or whatever. We actually now need to regard that feeling with a degree of suspicion. And so we can start to build critical distance. If we can build critical distance in ourselves, we dispel some of that magic and we can actually then impart that to kids, probably. Now, one of the other things that's really interesting here, and this is anecdotal, and if you're parents to sort of uh, tweens and early teens, you'll find out that the, if they're on Facebook, it's just to talk to the grandparents. It's not to talk to their peers. They're building their own private-ish networks. They're using a whole different bunch of tools. Facebook introduced Facebook Messenger for kids last week because they can see this as the new market, all right? Yeah, exactly. So kids as young as six can be on the Facebook. Uh, Not but, in my house. <laughs> but, but kids actually, I think, maybe have seen, oh my God, they've made a muddle of this. And in some ways, they're using networks that are smaller, that they can feel contained in, and maybe they feel are less manipulative. Whether or not they actually are is another question. I think that's, I mean, there's something in that. I mean, as you say, we're, we're a generation that could experience the world before. We're learning in this environment. Yeah. My kids are not. And my kids probably have far better instincts about, you know, the potentiality of, of the sort of things that you're talking about than we do. I mean, they may be better, you know, equipped to, to protect themselves. 
I don't think that lets us off the hook from, from having a good critical distance around this and trying to sort of bring them an awareness that the digital world is very, it's, it's filled with entities that will be truthful, entities that will be lie, will, will lie, and one of the best skills that they can have is discernment around that.